Good afternoon, sir. Where do you work? Uh, I'm self-employed now. Uh, when I lived here in Orlando, I was employed at the District 9 Medical Examiner's Office. And what time frame did you work at the District 9 Medical Examiner's Office? From April of 2008 until August of 2020. And what role did you serve there, or roles? I was the Deputy Chief Medical Examiner. And tell us about your undergraduate and your medical school training. So I have all of my education and training uh, from the University of Cincinnati in Cincinnati, Ohio. I have a, a Bachelor of Science degree in Biology, a Doctor of Medicine degree, five years of training in anatomic and clinical pathology, followed by a year of specialized training in surgical pathology, followed by a year of training in forensic pathology. I have been uh, certified by the American Board of Pathology in anatomic, clinical, and forensic pathology. I'm currently licensed to practice medicine in Ohio and Florida. And can you tell the jury what pathology is and then those subspecialties that you also mentioned? Yes. So pathology in its simplest form is simply the study of disease. Pathologists are physicians uh, who are usually employed by hospitals. Clinical pathologists oversee laboratory testing, analysis of blood and body fluids. Anatomic pathologists make diagnoses based on tissue samples and sometimes uh, autopsies. There is a subspecialty of anatomic pathology called forensic pathology, which deals with the investigation of death. And at the medical examiner's office, um, did you perform autopsies? Yes. And do you uh, continue to perform autopsies up in Ohio? I do. Approximately how many times have you conducted an autopsy? Well, I have personally uh, performed over 7,000 autopsies and been involved uh, personally in death investigations for a total of probably 10 or 11,000 uh, individuals. <clears throat> And did you perform an autopsy on somebody identified to you as Shante Cooper-Tronis? I did. Your Honor, at this time, could we reread the stipulation to the identity of the deceased? Was filed. And if you remember at the very beginning of the trial, I read you a stipulation and I told you at that time that certain facts, if they're stipulated to by the parties, the facts must be accepted as true by the jury. Um, the amount of weight you put in the facts, that's up to each one of you individually. However, a stipulation, again, if it's agreed by all the parties, um, it's to be accepted as true. This, the Assistant State Attorney, Michael Joseph Smith, and Defendant David Tronis, as well as his lawyer, Richard Zielinski, stipulate that the identity of the deceased in this case is Shanti M. Cooper Tronis. May I approach the witness with BR for identification, which is partially in evidence as states 68? You may. Autopsy process documented It is. You recognize image 66 on this exhibit? I do. And what do you recognize it as? That is the deceased Shanti Cooper Tronas as she presents in our morgue after she's been placed in the body bag and transported to our facility. Without objection, that's 79. And is the entire external and internal autopsy process documented with photography? Well, there are some aspects of the uh, internal examination that may not be documented, but pertinent findings are documented photographically. And can you just tell the jury about the medical examiner's office and their jurisdiction and role in the criminal justice system? Yes. So the medical examiner in the state of Florida is charged with investigating deaths that are due to uh, violence. That is something that 
is not a natural disease process. And also, in that, in that regard, uh, investigating deaths that are sometimes due to natural disease processes because we just don't know. So an individual is found deceased, has no medical history, uh, they may be injured, they may not, uh, they will come to uh, the office and they will be generally autopsied uh, to determine the cause of death. And have you ever given opinion testimony before about cause and manner of death? Yes, several, several hundred times. Have you ever not been allowed to give opinion testimony in these areas? No. So just explain to the jury, did you go out to the scene where these remains of Shante Trooper, uh, Tronis were, were collected? I did not. Uh, we, uh, the office sends uh, an investigator. These are individuals who are trained uh, to investigate scenes, uh, and they serve as the uh, eyes of the pathologists, if you will. Uh, and in this case, so uh, one of our individuals was sent to the scene twice, I believe, in this case, uh, to examine the body uh, and to uh, secure the body and make sure that it was, the body was transported uh, back to our facility intact. Do investigators from the medical examiner's office document their findings with photography? They do. Is that in part what you rely on when determining the ultimate cause and manner of death? Yes, frequently it is. And what other sorts of information in this case did you rely on besides the pho photography uh, taken by the investigator and your findings during the autopsy, if anything? Well, there would have been conversations, multiple conversations with uh, law enforcement. Uh, they may ask me particular questions, uh, give me background information, uh, ask me specific questions related to uh, their questioning of the defendant or other people. Uh, and in this case, um, I don't know that I needed any of that information to come to a conclusion as to the, the cause and manner of death. Do detectives frequently uh, witness uh, the autopsies that you all perform over there? Yes, uh, they often do. Uh, I, I don't recall in this case uh, if, uh, if they actually attended the autopsy. Um, I know we spoke afterwards. I'm not sure if they actually were, there, were present at the time. What sort of process, if any, does the body or the remains go through prior to being presented to you after it has arrived at the medical examiner's office? Well, the first thing we have is we have the story uh, from whoever found the body, law enforcement, and then we have the photographic uh, images of this death scene from our investigator as well as the background information that the investigator may get primarily from law enforcement or sometimes other family members. Uh, then the, uh, the body is uh, transported uh, to our facility where there will be an uh, initial determination as to whether or not uh, there needs to be any type of special procedures performed. I believe in this case there was a request from law enforcement to uh, obtain swabs for DNA analysis from the hands and the neck, uh, which we did perform. At that point, the body is then uh, removed uh, from the body bag, photographed, uh, at the scene, the investigator will have placed uh, paper bags on the feet and the hands to preserve evidence. And those will be carefully opened. Uh, the hands will be inspected. Uh, swabs are then obtained. Then the uh, body will be photographed as is. And uh, at some point, uh, the body needs to be cleaned so that we can tell the difference between a smear of blood and an actual injury. Uh, after the body has been cleaned, uh, we'll obtain a new set of photographs of uh, almost all of the body surfaces, paying particular attention to those areas of injury or apparent injury or anything else uh, unusual, uh, tattoos, scars, things like that. Uh, the body is, uh, has at that time already been weighed and measured. Uh, and then the autopsy will uh, commence. Uh, personally, I perform the autopsy um, the same way in just about every case, irrespective of the nature of the case, uh, which involves uh, then a removal of the organs, uh, paying particular attention to any evidence of injury or disease. From those organs, uh, individual sections uh, are retained uh, for future reference. Um, blood and body, fluid, uh, body fluids are obtained for toxicologic analysis. Um, at that point, uh, usually uh, in the cases of a traumatic death, uh, the cause of death is, uh, is apparent by that time. Uh, if not, uh, there may be other 
tests, studies that are, that are performed. Then the um, procedure will be documented. Uh, uh, the protocol will be completed. My report will be uh, typed. I'll review it and subsequently sign in. Your Honor, permission to publish states 68. You may. Is the monitor on in front of you, Doctor? Well, there's nothing. It is. Okay. Image 66. What are we looking at here? So this is the decedent, uh, and this is uh, right after the the bag has has been opened, and there's uh, smeared uh, blood uh, on the decedent that uh, was probably it probably didn't look like this at, at the scene, which is one of the reasons we we take the scene photographs. Does the medical examiner's office uh, have its own case numbering system? We do, and you can see that it is uh, indicated on there as case number 18-0726. Is the medical examiner's office a law enforcement agency? No. But you work with law enforcement agencies on many of these cases? Yes. And is the date recorded on, on the date the autopsy is performed? It is. Image 71, what are we looking at here? So we can see here the decedent's left hand, and you'll notice that there is a, a paper underneath that hand, and that is the cut paper bag uh, which was placed on her hands at the scene by our investigator. 72, what are we looking at? That's the back or dorsal surface of the left hand. Are there any signs of injury or trauma that uh, you took note of? Uh, there may be a small mark there on the anterior wrist, or I'm sorry, the posterior wrist, the dorsal wrist. Yes, right there. 73? Uh, same hand now, we're looking uh, at the lateral aspect of the left hand. Any signs of injury or trauma? That same mark appears to be there on the wrist. 74? Uh, now we're looking at the medial or toward the midline uh, aspect of the, of the hand, and I don't see anything there. I see some wrinkling of the skin that's uh, associated with uh, being placed in the paper bag. And why is it important in these types of cases to document um, a decedent's hands? Well, there's frequently questions that come up about, <clears throat> about the hands. Um, it's just a good policy. You don't know at the time that you're uh, starting the autopsy sometimes what questions may be asked. Uh, and uh, often uh, when people are uh, killed, uh, there will be a struggle and they will have some marks on their hands that could be important. 75. Now we're looking at the palmar aspect of the left hand. Any signs of injury or trauma? I don't see anything there. 76. Now we're looking at the right hand with the opened paper bag. 77. Now we see that same right hand and <clears throat> we see a sort of a vague uh, rectangular mark at the base of the thumb and the index finger, and uh, that's a slight abrasion, and then we see a more well-developed drying abrasion uh, on the uh, wrist. What is an abrasion? An abrasion is simply a superficial skin injury, like a skinned knee. That's, that is uh, an, an example of an abrasion. Would some of us call it a scrape? Yes. 78. Again, we see that uh, ill-defined area of abrasion on the back of the right hand. Uh, I don't see any, it might be a small mark below that. I don't see anything else. 79. Now we're looking at the uh, medial aspect of the, of the right hand without any, looks like there might be a small contusion on the, on the surface of the wrist there, the upper surface in the photograph. Yes. The arrow is? Correct. What is a contusion? A contusion is a bruise. It is simply a rupture of blood vessels uh, under the surface of the skin, and they will often present as a bluish, purplish, sometimes green or yellow color through the skin. 
And does the color of a bruise or contusion uh, change or evolve during the healing process? It does. Image 80. Now we're looking at the palm uh, of the right hand. Is there any sign of injury or trauma? I believe not. 82. Now we're looking at, the, at both feet. Again, they were, had been placed in paper bags. The bags have been uh, cut open. And we're looking at the feet now. 83, what are we looking at? Now we are looking at the face of the decedent uh, after uh, the skin has been cleaned. And uh, we can see <clears throat> several, there's several things that we can see here. First of all, we can see that the left eye, both the upper and lower eyelid, um, are darkened, they're swollen, so she has hemorrhage under the skin of the left upper and lower eyelids. What is a hemorrhage? Hemorrhage is bleeding. Uh, she also has, um, over the uh, cheekbone, uh, there's a dark spot that you can see that is actually a laceration. A laceration is a blunt injury uh, of, the, of the skin or any other organ, uh, which results in tearing. Uh, of the skin. It's not uh, caused by a sharp instrument. Um, and that actually goes uh, down to the, uh, to the bone. Didn't appear to be any fracture there. And then you can also see that there's some swelling associated uh, <clears throat> with uh, that injury on the left side of the face. Um, she also has a number, uh, if you look at the facial skin, she's got some uh, small uh, dots dark red dots on the skin surface. Uh, those are petechial hemorrhages. Those are small, very small hemorrhages that occur on the skin, primarily in the face, the eyelids, or in the um, clear uh, lining of our eyes. And what sorts of things causes petechial hemorrhaging? Well, <clears throat> they can be seen uh, in a lot of uh, cases of uh, traumatic and natural deaths. Uh, they're most commonly associated with deaths associated with uh, strangulation or compression of the torso. Um, and although they, they can occur in, in many uh, circumstances, uh, it's a matter of degree. So usually in a case of uh, strangulation, and they are present in the vast majority of cases of strangulation, uh, you will see quite a few uh, petechial hemorrhages, whereas in cases of people that die from heart disease or whatever, uh, some other type of trauma. They can have scattered uh, petechial hemorrhages, but usually not to the same extent that you see in a person who has been strangled. What causes the swelling of tissue when it's been injured? Well, <clears throat> when the tissue uh, is, is injured, there is actually a leakage of fluid uh, from the vasculature, and that's what causes uh, the swelling. And is that process the same uh, in somebody who is alive versus somebody who is deceased? No, uh, we wouldn't expect to see uh, swelling uh, once the person no longer has a heartbeat. So turning back to this photograph, the injury involving the left eye and the eyelids, does that seem to be indicative of pre-death because of the swelling? Uh, the swelling and uh, the coloration. I mean, there can be circumstances, for instance, if I were to autopsy a person who didn't have uh, dark swollen eyelids like that and turn them over on the autopsy table and leave them like that for a day, uh, they could develop uh, something that looks similar to this. This sort of blunt force trauma that we see in this image, is that consistent with uh, a punch from a human being? It could be. Uh, it could be uh, a fall. It could be uh, any, number of, uh, any number of things, any number of uh, injuries can cause uh, this type of appearance. And the injury on the cheek, is that also consistent with a punch from a human being who might have been wearing um, a ring on one of his or her fingers? Yes. And you said that injury went down to the bone? It did. Is that the sort of injury that would have required stitches or sutures if uh, she had survived the attack? I think most uh, likely, yes. An injury like that, um, would it bleed a lot? In general, uh, yes, injuries to the head uh, because there's such a risk, uh, uh, rich vascular supply, a lot of blood vessels 
uh, in the head, it tends to bleed quite a bit. 84, what are we looking at here? We're looking at now the head and the torso. Um, you can see there that there's a small bruise above the right breast. Uh, there's another one over the uh, right uh, uh, collarbone or clavicle. And then you can also see that there's, uh, even in this picture, you can see on the top of the um, right shoulder, uh, there's a bruise. And on the right upper arm, there's bruising. And then you can also see um, there's a dark area on the uh, right side of the, of the neck, uh, an abrasion. What are we looking at in 85? Now we're looking at the lower torso. And here we can see most prominently over the superior aspects, the upper aspects of both knees, uh, there's uh, abrasions there. So as I mentioned earlier, the skinned knee. The difference here is that um, when you fall and skin your knee, the, the abrasion is actually a little bit below the, the midline of the knee. In this case, uh, these abrasions are above the midline uh, of the knee. So that leads me to believe that these were most likely caused by dragging uh, the individual in a face down position. Is there anything you can say about these injuries above the knees in relation to time of death? No, they appear to be, um, they appear to have occurred either right before or right after of the death. They, they appear to be the same age as the other injuries that I've seen here. 86. Now we see the knees again with the, uh, the rest of the legs, and I don't believe there are any other injuries there. 87. So now we're looking at the left side of her face, and we again see uh, in uh, better detail uh, that uh, injury over her uh, cheekbone, uh, and you can see that it is, uh, you, I think you can appreciate from that picture that it is, it is deep. It completely uh, goes through the, the skin surface down to the, down to the bone, uh, the zygomatic arch, which is the, the portion of our skull that forms the cheekbone. Um, in this picture, you can also see that she's got an injury uh, to her ear. Uh, back here, you can see that there's dark red area of her ear. That's an abrasion. 88. Now, this is a close-up of that injury in the cheekbone area. And so now we can see that not only is the skin split there, uh, but you can see that there's a surrounding uh, abrasion, which uh, is termed an impact abrasion. So this is, a, this is an example of, an, of a blunt impact injury, which caused a laceration of the skin and a surrounding abrasion. 89. That's a close-up of that abrasion on the, on the left ear. 90. Now we see the, the right side of her face, and she's got a uh, couple of things going on here. Number one, you can still see a lot of those small dots, those petechial hemorrhages on the skin. Uh, you can also see now that on her uh, right uh, cheekbone, uh, just below it, uh, she's got some discoloration there. That's a, that's a bruise. And then also um, she's got uh, at the angle of the jaw, the, the, the mandible here, she, in, this, in this location, she's got another area of, uh, of bruising. And then you can also now see that uh, more prominently, you can see that uh, area of uh, abrasion on the uh, anterior neck. What's the actual physical mechanism that causes petechial hemorrhaging? What, what's going on with the blood vessels? Well, <clears throat> so the blood vessels, uh, in the case of strangulation, we have, uh, we have a compression of, of the neck, compression of the vasculature. It's very difficult to compress the uh, carotid arteries, which are the major blood supply uh, to the head. However, it's relatively easy to compress the jugular veins. So in cases of uh, strangulation, uh, often what occurs is the blood can still get into the head through the carotid arteries with some force, uh, but it can't drain. And under that pressure of the, of the blood continuing to be pumped into the head, but being unable to drain, small blood vessels burst and produce the petechial hemorrhage. 
Image 91. Again, we see that contusion around the chin, uh, most prominent on the right. There's a little bit on the left. Uh, and now we can also see that there are those petechial hemorrhages. Um, they have, uh, they, they, they appear to be present uh, above a certain line of the neck and not, and not below it. Again, we can also see that uh, linear uh, abrasion uh, on the right side of the neck. 92. So now we're looking down at the top of her uh, right shoulder, and we can see, again, the same types of injuries. Uh, there's some abrasions there. Uh, there is a, they sur there are, seem to be completely surrounded by an area of bruising. And what are the sorts of things that cause uh, abrasions surrounded by contusions or scrapes surrounded by bruises like that? Well, <clears throat> any blunt. Any blunt trauma uh, can produce uh, this picture. Um, you see these kinds of things in cases of strangulation uh, because it's either the attacker or the, the victim. Um, in the case of the victim, it would be them trying to remove uh, or move the, the hand or the, the arm or the ligature. Uh, in the case of the attacker, it's uh, usually the fact that the victim is fighting back, struggling, and there's some pressure uh, put on a part of the body, either by something in the person's hand or by their own fingernails or something else. You mentioned the word ligature. Can you spell that for Madam Court Reporter and then tell us what you're talking about? L-I-G-A-T-U-R-E. A ligature is a, a, like a, a rope or a cord uh, that can, is frequently used in strangulation or hangings. 93. A close-up now of that shoulder. Again, you can see the fairly clearly defined three separate areas of abrasion, but the area of contusion surrounding it uh, is, less, is less defined, and that is, that's typical of a contusion. And these three separate areas, is that consistent with fingers? It could be. I mean, I couldn't rule out something else. It's a nonspecific injury, but it certainly could be. What are we looking at in image 94? She has a small bruise above uh, her right breast. And are there any injuries uh, on her right arm that we can see? Yes, we can see a small area, that small area of abrasion again, and then there's some uh, ill-defined area of uh, bruising on her right forearm. And then we can also see uh, just at the bottom left square, uh, bottom left of the black square, we can see some uh, areas of bruising in her uh, right upper arm. Are the injuries on her right arm consistent, among other things, uh, but consistent with forceful grabbing? Yes. 95? That's a better view of her right upper arm showing the injury on the shoulder. And then we can see several areas of bruising on the uh, front and sides of her right upper arm. 96. A close-up of, of that contusion on the right upper arm. 98. Now we see some contusions of the right forearm as well as that uh, abrasion over the right wrist. Do any of these contusions on the forearm almost appear linear? Uh, they do, uh, and those are the types of injuries that you would see if a person were grabbed uh, by the arm. Linear is, that was my fault using that word, straight line-ish? Yes. 99. A close-up of that. Uh, and you can see how sometimes when you get closer to the bruise, it seems even less uh, well-defined. And that's just the nature of the, of the injury. And again, these sorts of things that we're looking at, are, is that something that is indicative of pre-death injuries? Yes. 100. What are we looking at here? Uh, we're looking at that area of uh, abrasion. Again, that's a superficial injury of the skin, and uh, it's, it's dried, uh, it's dark red. Um, you can produce abrasions in individuals after death. Uh, they tend to have more of an orange-yellow appearance uh, than this. 101. 
Again, the right hand showing that uh, pretty well-defined abrasion uh, and some contusions on the uh, back of the, of the right wrist and then also at the base of the thumb and the index finger, we see that sort of triangularly shaped, uh, I, think it's, I think it's actually a very superficial abrasion. Among other things, are those contusions or bruises around her wrist consistent with fingertips? It could be, yes. 102? A close-up of that triangular area of uh, superficial abrasion on the right hand. 103? Now we have the palm uh, of the right hand, and I don't see any injuries there. She does have uh, some uh, sort of bluish discoloration of this part of her hand which is something that I see in a, a lot of people who are deceased that have no trauma whatsoever. So I'm not saying that it, that it, it, it could be an injury, but I think it probably isn't given the location of it. 104. So now we're looking, I think, at the Palmer aspect, and now we have a little bit more in that area, not just, not just in this area at the base of the thumb, but moving on to the rest of the hand. So I believe that that is most likely an injury there. 105. Now, <clears throat> what we're doing there is we're, uh, we're pulling up the upper lip to expose the inside of, of the lip. So the outside of our lip is like, is like skin. The inside is not. It's, a, it's a, a, what we call a mucosal lining. And uh, you can see that she has that dark, uh, deep purplish coloration there. Those are contusions. And if you um, look over on the left side of her cheek, uh, you can see that it's much darker red there, and um, <clears throat> that's actually, there might even be some uh, adherent blood clot in, in that photo. It's hard, it's hard to tell, but she does have a, quite a, um, a pronounced area of uh, laceration, again, a tearing of the skin uh, in the inside of the left cheek. Is that consistent with blunt force trauma being applied to the outside of her mouth? Yes. Um, it's the kind of injury that you frequently see in an individual who's been punched. But it could be due to some other uh, blunt impact injury, or it could even be due to you know an individual's face being driven uh, against a, a, a hard object. 106. Same same view, but now it's the lower lip showing that uh, we have the same type of contusion, and these these injuries, these bruises, are caused when the the rather soft part of our the lip is pushed against the hard teeth, producing an injury. And did she, in fact, have a cracked molar? She did. I believe it was tooth number two, uh, the right second upper molar was, was uh, cracked. Now, I don't know when that occurred. That could have happened uh, prior to the rest of the injuries. And so number one would be your backmost molar, and then yes. number two is the second one in? Correct. 107. So now we have a better view of the inside of uh, the inside of her uh, left cheek, and um, there's not much in that picture that's that's normal. Perhaps the very bottom of of that, uh, where I believe that's most likely my finger there, pulling her cheek open. The rest of it is uh, lacerated and uh, contused. 108. Now we're looking at the right side. Uh, not a great picture, uh, but we can see that there's a similar process going on on the right, but not to the same extent as we saw on the left. 109. Now we have a small area of uh, abrasion over the, the, um, the left hip, and I don't know if we can see much in the way of... Uh, contusion on her arm there. Difficult for me to see from that, that photo. And then there looks like there's a small abrasion on her left, um, left side of her chest below the breast. 110. These are the uh, contusion on the forearm. Uh, again, at the, the close-up, it, it seems to almost blend in with the rest of the, of the skin. 111. We can see a very small area of uh, uh, contusion on the back of her left wrist and perhaps some contusion on the back of the hand also at the base of the 
index finger. 112? That's the uh, base of the index finger, uh, and we can see that there, the crease that you see there, the indentation, that's due to the, a wrinkle in the, in the paper of the bag. That's not an injury itself, but you can see that there is a bruise uh, there, a, an, an area of uh, dark and uh, purplish discoloration. 113. Now we see an area uh, at the uh, costal margin, that is the margin between the, the rib and the abdomen on the left, and we see an area of bruising there. Where the pointer is? That's correct. 114. Now we see a better uh, 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 image depicting the bruise uh, that is uh, above her right breast. 117. And then very small areas of uh, uh, bruising above her left breast. 119. That's the area of bruising. And then you can see centrally, there's very, very small uh, pinpoint areas of uh, abrasion and centrally located within that bruise. Consistent with blunt force trauma? Yes. 120. Now we're looking again at that left costal margin between the rib and the abdomen. We can see that there's a small area of abrasion there. 123. And now we're looking at those areas of abrasions on her, the front aspect of her knees. 124. A close up uh, showing um, the area of abrasion. And you'll notice uh, centrally it seems to be confluent, it's all the same color. And, uh, but as we get out to the edges of it, uh, it, uh, it appears to, to have more of a pinpoint type of uh, pattern. And that's due to the, um, you see how the surface of the skin there is not completely smooth. Each hair follicle has a small a muscle associated with it, and it causes the, the flesh to be raised there, goose flesh or goose pimples that occurs even when we're dead. And what happens is when you drag the surface of that skin, uh, it's the areas that are, that are most prominently raised, they're the first areas that are going to be abraded. And so centrally, it doesn't matter, it's all abraded there. But as we get out to the edges of that, only the areas that were raised now appear injured, and the rest of the intervening skin is normal. 126. Just another uh, photo showing the abrasion over the knees. 127. And again, probably better demonstrated than this picture than in the previous. You can see how, as we get to the periphery, that uh, the area of injury is limited now only to those raised areas of the flesh. And what, if anything, can you tell us about uh, the centerish area of the lower left abrasion that's darker colored than the rest of it? It's just an area that was subjected to more pressure and bled a little bit more than the surrounding area. 129, just with scale? Uh, same, same area of abrasion. What are we looking at here in 132? Okay, so now this is a good picture of her anterior neck, the front of her neck. And so we see again on the uh, right side of her neck, there's that area of abrasion, which in some of the pictures looked like a straight line. But in this picture, you can see it's, it's not really a straight line. Um, and then in addition to that, you'll see these small areas of uh, abrasion, and then you'll see a number of these petechial hemorrhages. Um, there's also uh, to the, to the, um, just to the left of the midline, uh, you can see there's a, there's a fairly uh, well-formed uh, contusion there. And then on both sides of her, of her jaw now, you can appreciate in this picture that she has these sort of reddish, purplish contusions on, on both, side of, both sides of her jaw. These injuries taken together, are they indicative of anything to you? Well, at this point, you know, not having done the internal exam, but seeing what I saw now, I think any forensic pathologist with even uh, a minimal experience would say, this is probably strangulation. 133. So now we're seeing with the ruler in place, we're seeing those small areas of petechial hemorrhage and abrasion. And uh, at the top of the ruler there, you can see the area of uh, bruising. Uh, on the on the jaw jawline. 
134. Same thing, we're looking now and we see uh, areas of uh, abrasion, we see the contusion, we see the injury to the left cheekbone, and also the injury to the left ear. And notice in this picture how it's not just that area of uh, abrasion uh, on the ear, I'll demonstrate it on my right, uh, it's not just that area of abrasion here, but the whole top half of her ear is, uh, is discolored. It's, that is also a contusion. Indicative of blunt force trauma? Yes. 135? Now we can see pretty clearly here the small pinpoint hemorrhages, the petechial hemorrhages uh, spread over the, over the face, uh, the skin of the face and the upper neck. Seems to stop at, at, the, at a line about midway in the neck, uh, which is uh, often seen in cases of uh, strangulation. And then we also see uh, that area of contusion, uh, more, more well-developed uh, and visible on the jawline than it is on the uh, left side of the, of the neck, but that is also an area of, of injury. 136. So now we're looking at the left ear, and then it's been folded uh, forward, and uh, we see two injuries uh, here. One is the uh, crescent-shaped uh, injury between the, where the ear attaches uh, to the scalp, and that is, again, a, a blunt force uh, injury. That's a tearing of the, of the ear. You could just imagine if the more force were applied, it, it might just loosen the entire ear. And then below it is a, another uh, superficial, relatively superficial laceration. It's going through this, the top layer of the skin and into the subcutaneous tissue, the tissue below the skin, into the soft tissue. There's some, you can see a little bit of adipose or fat tissue in there, and the rest of it is mostly muscle. Is anything uh, that we see here consistent with her having worn kind of a stud earring, which had the pointy part? still poking out and then the back clasp? That could be one of the reasons that we see that injury, uh, uh, the, lower, the lower injury, the one more to the left. Um, I doubt that it explains the, uh, the tear, the crescent-shaped tear. So the, the injury to the left in this image uh, could be explained by an earring such as I described, but the crescent tear on the right is not. Correct. Just to scale in 137? Yeah, it's a close up. And again, now you can see a little bit better that there's a bruising involving the, 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 the ear itself, as well as the lacerations, which we talked about earlier. Is there any sort of injury going on in the top of this image on this part of her ear as well? Yes, that looks like an area, another area of uh, abrasion, probably uh, related to the other, un other larger underlying, more square-shaped area of disruption. 138. Now we see again that, um, that sort of linear, sort of not linear area of abrasion on the right side of the neck and, the, and the, also the associated uh, uh, petechial hemorrhages. 139. Yeah, that's a close-up of that area. And you can see that in a close-up, it doesn't really, it's not really a line now. Um, it's uh, probably a, a number of different scrapes. I mean, given what I know about the case and the conclusion that I came to, I would say that it most likely represents the, um, it's either the attacker's, uh, something in the attacker's hand, uh, pressing against uh, the, the, the neck skin, or uh, the victim, uh, the decedent's uh, attempts to, uh, to remove uh, the attacker's hand from the, from the neck. 140. Now we're looking at the back of the left hand. Um, I don't see much in there on the wrist. There looks like there's a little pinpoint area of uh, abrasion. 141. Left hand again from the um, lateral aspect. Uh, I don't see much in that picture. Then 142. Now the left hand from the side and the palm, and again, they, they don't show much in the way of injury, but you can see from this photo and the other ones that the, 
fingernails of the decedent are robust, they're long, and uh, they're easily uh, capable of producing uh, ab abrasions on the skin of the neck. And we've seen 144 pre-cleanup. Anything different about this one? No. Same for 145? Correct. Or same for 146? Yes. And 147? Yes. What are we looking at in 148? So we spoke earlier, we're looking at her, her, her right eye. And uh, there's a forceps instrument there that's uh, uh, opening the, the, the lid. Uh, so remember, the, the, the right eye is the one that's uh, the, the, least, the less uh, injured of the, of the two. And uh, what we see here is um, toward the bottom of the, of, the, of the photo, the bottom, the lower lid, you'll see there's what looks like blood. And it is. That's what that is. That is a, that is a confluent area of hemorrhage. Um, sometimes you will have the petechial hemorrhages and they will be um, discrete, small dots. Sometimes those dots sort of run together. And then sometimes you get just frank scleral hemorrhage, right? Uh, the scleral is the, is sclera is the white part of the eye. You'll just get hemorrhage within that membrane. Uh, it's, still, it's still contained there. You couldn't wash that away. Uh, it would be contained uh, by the conjunctival membrane, that transparent membrane that covers the surfaces of our eyes and eyelids. But again, um, that is a, a, a something that you'll see in an individual who has been strangled. 149. Now we see not only that area of uh, dark uh, hemorrhage, but now we see the small dots, the more classic appearance of the petechial hemorrhages. 150. Now we're looking at the upper uh, upper lid on the, uh, I believe that's the left eye now, and uh, we can see um, that there's the same type of process here. There's a diffuse area of of hemorrhage within the sclera and the conjunctivi. You can also appreciate in this picture that the, uh, the iris um, and the pupil in that photo, they're not as clear as I might expect them to be. It uh, looks a little bit cloudy. And that's something that happens um, in the post-mortem interval. That's something that I would expect to see happen in a body that is not uh, fresh, shall we say. And so that's a relative term, fresh. Um, and I know from previous conversations with you, you'll say every person is uniquely different, but is there any sort of time frame we're looking at when you start to see this? Well, um, it's, not, it's not predictable. So in other words, I can autopsy someone that I know has been dead for a couple of days and their eyes don't appear cloudy, and then I can have another individual who maybe is dead 24 hours or less, and they, they can look cloudy. So it's... Uh, these are what we call soft findings. Uh, they're indications. Uh, so in other words, if I see a person and their eyes are cloudy and I get the story that, well, they were just alive two hours ago, I'm starting to doubt that. But I don't know that I could completely rule it out. 151. And now we're looking again at the left eye and the lower eyelid, and we can see some of those uh, petechial hemorrhages now uh, a little bit more uh, prominent, but they're not as, uh, they're still s identifiable as separate uh, dots of hemorrhage. 152. Now we're just elevating the eyelid there, and uh, I, I don't see any uh, petechial hemorrhages in that area. 153. Now we can see we sort of, uh, we are everting the, the eyelid sort of turning it inside out. There's some very small petechial hemorrhages there in the lower portion of the picture. And then uh, uh, laterally to the side, you can see uh, that area of uh, contained, uh, confluent uh, dark red uh, hemorrhage. 173, what are we looking at here? Well, now we're looking at the, <clears throat> the side of her head. So during the course of the autopsy, we need to expose uh, the skull so that we can cut the bone of the skull and examine the brain. Uh, that is accomplished by making an incision from behind one ear right over the top of the head to a point behind uh, the opposite ear. The scalp then is reflected 
or um, sort of stretched over. So the front part of the scalp will be pulled down over the forehead. The back part of the scalp will be pulled down over the back of the head. In that photo, what you were looking at is now the left side of her head after the scalp has been reflected. And did we see any bleeding or hemorrhaging there? This is diffusely hemorrhagic. And what does that mean? It's all, it's all, it's all hemorrhage there. Were there any fractures to her skull? There were. So she had some fractures um, on the left side uh, of her head, the temporal bone, which is a relatively thin bone uh, of the skull. And uh, that was not just a linear fracture. That was a, a complex fracture that involved small particles of, uh, of the bone, sort of called a comminuted fracture. And that fracture extended uh, up uh, the side of her head and also in, it went down into the base of the, of the skull. And was that consistent with the external findings that you saw of injury to her ear and that part of her head? Yes. Were there any other fractures to her head? Uh, there were fractures that extended from that general area uh, to what we call the orbital plate. So there's a, the, as our, there's a uh, thin plate of bone that sits over our eyes, and uh, that was fractured on the left. And that's why she had that such pronounced hemorrhage in her left uh, upper and lower eyelids. Is that consistent with uh, being struck by a, an adult male? It is. Let's talk about her neck. When you did the internal portion of the autopsy of her neck, did you see anything further that we have not discussed? Yeah, so at this point, um, you know, I'm uh, fairly confident that this appears to be a strangulation. So now I will pay particular attention uh, to the muscles uh, and the subcutaneous, the tissue just below the skin of the neck. And I will dissect those muscles individually. And then I will look for areas of injury which are classically associated with strangulation. And uh, I find uh, most of those in this case. So there is a, uh, most famously, I think, is the hyoid bone, which uh, most people associate with strangulation. It's actually not the most commonly injured structure in the neck in strangulation, but it is one of them. And in this case, uh, that U-shaped bone um, gets, uh, when a person is strangled, that, that bone is pressed against the spinal column of the neck, which is unyielding. It's a massive area of bone. And the hyoid bone is relatively... Um, very thin, and uh, in some cases pliable, and to an extent it can be bent, but at some point the tips of it will fracture. Now I know that uh, this was something that occurred while um, she was still alive because there was hemorrhage uh, in the soft tissue associated with fractures on both sides. The other structures that are commonly injured are injuries to with the thyroid cartilage, and we can all feel the thyroid cartilage in men that's the Adam's apple. That's part of the thyroid cartilage. Now, the thyroid cartilage has two horns that come up, and they actually um, communicate via a thin wisps of fibrous tissue with the tips of the hyoid bone. And in this case, both of those horns of the thyroid cartilage were, were fractured. In addition to that, she also had hemorrhage in the muscles that were over, overlying the larynx and in the soft tissue that uh, overlies the uh, thyroid gland, which is present on either side of, of our neck. And those, uh, and she also had some, some uh, hemorrhage uh, in the thin layer uh, of the cervical spine, the cervical, uh, the bony part of the, of the neck. She had a, some hemorrhage into the soft tissue there. So these are all uh, markers of force. These are not injuries that in and of themselves are going to kill a person. They just indicate to me that force has been applied uh, to the neck consistent with strangulation. What are we looking at here in 185? So at the time of the autopsy, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, we did obtain uh, swabs uh, from the, um, the hands and the neck. And uh, those are, this is the uh, packaging photo to indicate these, these are the specimens that were obtained. Uh, they have uh, the case label on them. 
uh, that little thing that looks like a seagull is actually uh, my initial. And um, this indicates that we have uh, head hair, uh, fingernails right and left, and the swabs from the hands and the neck, as well as a, um, a blood spot card in that envelope. And were you requested to also get oral, vaginal, and anal swabs of this victim? Yes. And any belongings she had, such as the jewelry she was wearing and her clothes, would have also been packaged up and submitted for collection by law enforcement? Yes, they were. All right, we can have the lights, Mr. Uh, Madam Clerk. Any other external or internal uh, findings relevant to cause and manner of death that we have not discussed yet? Uh, she also had a fairly prominent hemorrhage and the back of the tongue, the base of the tongue, and then some less prominent areas of hemorrhage on the sides of the tongue, probably due to uh, interaction with her own teeth. Uh, the hemorrhage uh, in the back of the tongue is something that is often seen in cases of strangulation. Is there uh, a distinguish, some distinguishment? Is there uh, a distinction, there we go, between manual and uh, ligature strangulation to be made? Yes, so um, how can we strangle a person? Uh, well, uh, one way you can strangle a person is by using a rope, a cord, that's a, a ligature, um, and uh, that produces usually a pretty dramatic, uh, you know, line Sometimes it's you know even deep right across the right across the neck. It's very similar to what we see most commonly in people who hang themselves, which we see much more commonly than we see individuals who are strangled. Uh, you could uh, strangle a person by um, just using the hands, and those are the cases where we tend to see uh, impressions, small areas of bruising associated with the pressure of the fingertips. Uh, you also tend to see more injury to the larynx in those cases. And then uh, you can also, um, you could strangle a person uh, by using the, 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 the broad surface of an arm or the, the uh, crook of the elbow by applying similar pressure uh, to the neck. In some of those cases, um, there's, there are very few uh, telltale uh, marks that, that are left because you're dealing with a, uh, relatively broad, soft tissue of an, of an arm with uh, the soft tissue of the neck. Were you able to come to a conclusion about the cause of her death? I believe that her, the cause of her death is a, a combination of the strangulation and the blunt head trauma. Strangulation alone, I think, is sufficient to explain the death. She's obviously been strangled. And I think the blood trauma to the head alone may be sufficient. Uh, so uh, in this case, I can't say uh, for certain. Uh, I know that both the head injury that we saw there, uh, that she was alive for both that and for the, the strangulation. Manner of death. What is the five different manners of death a forensic pathologist can attribute to a death? So um, as I mentioned earlier, the, the whole purpose of the autopsy is uh, why the person died, the cause of death. And that's just the physiologic derangement that, that causes a person no longer to be alive. Blunt head trauma, strangulation, cancer, pneumonia. Um, but in the, in the world of forensic pathology, uh, we're charged not only with uh, identifying the cause of death, but also the circumstances under which uh, the death occurred, the manner of death. And the manners of death are natural, natural disease, accident, uh, suicide, person took their own life, uh, homicide, death is a result of the action of another person. And then sometimes, when we can't tell, we can't tell because we simply don't have enough information uh, based on the condition of the remains, or there's two equally likely possibilities, say accident versus suicide. Um, and then cases like that, we will use the, the term undetermined for the manner. Were you able to decide upon a manner of Shante Cronus's death? Yes, in this case, the manner of death is homicide. And why is that? Uh, because I don't believe that there's any way that this individual would have sustained those injuries as a result of accident. I don't believe that they're consistent with self-inflicted 
injury. It's definitely not natural disease, and it is uh, almost classic for uh, strangulation. Is this consistent with a fall into a bathtub, either striking her head or striking her neck or both somehow? Well, certainly there could be some component of that, uh, but it doesn't, it doesn't uh, explain the extent and location and quality of those injuries. And what actually caused her death? What was the mechanism of death or causes? Well, um, in strangulation, <clears throat> what we're dealing with here is a, a type of death that's generally classified as asphyxial or asphyxiation. And there are different types of asphyxial deaths. The bottom line is there is a deficit of oxygen. So in this case, in the case of strangulation, you're compressing uh, the veins of the neck. Uh, blood can't drain from the head. Therefore, new blood can't get in. The brain is starved of uh, oxygen. It's not only starved of oxygen, uh, it also can't be, um, it also can't rid itself of the metabolic uh, waste products that are produced constantly while we're alive. So there has to be cir good circulation to the head at all times. Just a few minutes uh, without that circulation, or even less, uh, can result in uh, loss of consciousness and uh, death. And to follow up on that, to, to cause one's death through str strangulation, is it anywhere like those movies that depict it being instantaneous? Well, um, you know, there, are many, there aren't many areas uh, in my field where we can resort to experimentation. You know, we can't, we can't shoot people, we can't hang people. Um, uh, not to be facetious about it, but so you end up, you end up dealing with the, the accumulation of the, of the cases that you and your, your colleagues have done. So there, there, isn't, uh, there isn't really a, uh, well, sorry, what was the question again? Is death by strangulation instantaneous, or does it take some amount of time? So one area which there actually has been some experimentation back during World War II, uh, they used prisoners. They volunteered, really, they, as part of the war effort. They were having a problem with pilots blacking out. And uh, these researchers uh, developed this contraption that would actually, um, it was like a blood pressure cuff, but applied to a person's neck. And uh, it would completely block not only the venous uh, uh, return, but it would also block the carotid arteries and even the vertebral arteries, which are small arteries in the back of our necks. So complete loss of uh, blood circulation to the brain. Uh, some of those individuals uh, lost consciousness uh, within 10 to 12 seconds. Now, uh, there's no way another person could efficiently strangle a person um, that completely. So. And because there's often a struggle uh, during that time, uh, the person doesn't die right away. How long does it take? Um, I really don't know because uh, I haven't, you know, we haven't done those studies and we don't know how this person was strangled. We don't know if it occurred with overwhelming force all at once or it was a little force and then a little bit more force and then a little bit less and then a little bit more. But certainly you could accomplish uh, asphyxiation within a period of minutes. That's, I think, uh, being generous. Now, because we have a lot of people that uh, video uh, and post uh, videos, we see people uh, who have uh, been placed in chokeholds, um, and some of those people lose consciousness again in a very short period of time, 10, 15 seconds. The external injuries that we saw to her head you testified earlier that that can produce uh, significant amounts of bleeding. Yes. Um, such that it could saturate uh, a carpet. Yes. In the padding underneath the carpet. Yes. If that person is there and not moved uh, during this bleeding process. Correct. Are all of your opinions offered today offered within a reasonable degree of medical certainty? Yes, they are. No other questions. Thank you, State. Defense Cross. Good afternoon. Now, you've testified it's your job to determine the cause and the manner of death, correct? That's correct. Not the who? No, that's, that's true. You indicated that you found it to be 
blunt force trauma and strangulation. Um, it could be one or the other, correct? It could be. What time did you perform this particular autopsy? 9 a.m. Would that have been likely your first case of the day? Oh, um, it, likely, yes. 9 a.m. on what day? Um, let me refer to my report here. That is on the, the 25th. So the, the, she was pronounced in the afternoon of the 24th, and uh, I believe about 4 p.m. And then uh, that's when she was pronounced, not necessarily when she died. And then uh, the autopsy was done the following morning. Um, and during your direct, you talked about the fact that, you're, that the medical examiner's office, they hire uh, investigators to go out to the scene so that you don't have to do that yourself, correct? Correct. Um, and in this case, the medical examiner investigator that went to the scene was Ralph Halachi, correct? Correct. As part of his duties, does he prepare a report? He does. And what's the purpose of that report? Uh, it's so that I can have a, um, a hard copy of, uh, of what the, the circumstances surrounding the death are before I do the autopsy. And how does that help you? Well, it's so that you know what you're, what you're dealing with. Um, Otherwise, you might just rely on uh, a spoken uh, uh, word, and that's not as reliable, especially if you have, you know, five or six cases that day. Um, so the, 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 pur the purpose of the investigative report is to guide us on the initial approach uh, to the examination. Is it important to your evaluation at all uh, to know the status of the body or the circumstances of the body at the time that it's located? Um, I think it is. Um, I mean, I, I suppose there are, I have colleagues who would almost prefer not to know and just proceed with the autopsy, but I don't think that's the proper way to examine. And why is that? Well, because uh, the autopsy is a, is a medical procedure. Um, it's the last medical procedure that's going to be performed on the deceased. And just like an individual who goes to the doctor with some complaint, I mean, you wouldn't go to the doctor if you're having chest pain and then you get there and you don't say anything. I mean, it, it makes a difference. You, you, can't, uh, you can't look at everything in every case. So it's important to have the background information. Um, one of the examples I frequently use is a person with a gunshot wound. Um, I mean, if you just bring me a body and there's a gunshot wound, like, you might say, was there a gun present? Because if there's not a gun present, now I'm worried that somebody else shot this person instead of them shooting themselves. So the circumstances are absolutely essential, I think, in the death investigation. And there, you have to have the circumstances if you're going to make a determination on the manner of death. And in the report, um, which is in evidence, this is in evidence as Exhibit 69, uh, medical examiner investigator Ralph Kalachi indicated on that report that rigor is minor. What does that mean? I don't know. Um, that's not a term that I would use, uh, but I'm assuming that he means it's not full rigor. Okay. So uh, uh, when a person, uh, rigor mortis, which occurs uh, unfortunately in a varying rate at the time of after death, uh, is just stiffening of the of the muscles. At some point, the rigor will uh, be be either broken manually or will pass naturally. So in this case, I'm interpreting his uh, term minor to mean that it's not full rigor. That could mean that uh, the person just died. Uh, uh, you you got there within an hour or two. In that case, you should probably notice that the skin is warm still, as opposed to being cold. And uh, if you do find a deceased person and they have just died within that last hour or two, uh, they won't be completely stiff. Uh, they will still be rather flexible. Uh, rigor will then proceed. Eventually, they will become, they will be in full rigor. And this, it, depending on the body habitus, I mean, if there's large muscle groups involved, it can be very, very stiff. It can be a, like a chore, you know, to, to extend, for instance, the arms or to flex the, the legs of a person who's in full rigor, and it's uh, almost impossible to uh, open their mouth uh, if they're in, in full rigor. So 
after a period of time, you, the rigor will pass and you will be able to flex the, uh, the joints and open the mouth. And when you examined the body on the morning of April 25th, um, the body was in fixed rigor at that time? No, at, at, in my examination, uh, the, the uh, rigor I described as, as passing uh, in the extremities and uh, remained somewhat fixed in the jaw, but yet I was still able to, uh, uh, to uh, open, open the jaw. And then um, in Investigator Kalachi's report, he also indicated that the lividity is unfixed. Um, how, how did you interpret that? Uh, so that is a that is a term that that we will use. Uh, liver mortis um, is another uh, we call post mortem phenomenon. And uh, when we die, the blood's no longer circulating, so it tends to pool uh, based on gravity. So if you're laying face up, uh, the backside of your body will uh, be dark uh, red, purple. Uh, if you were to change the position of the body. Uh, before the uh, lividity is fixed, it will shift. So you can have a person with lividity on the posterior aspect of the body, uh, they're relatively fresh, you turn them over, and that lividity from the back completely disappears, and now it's all in the front. At some point, you're not gonna be able to do that. And one of the ways that we train our investigators to assess that is simply by taking a, a, a finger and pressing the area uh, of, of lividity to see if it blanches. So if you can push that blood, if the blood is still within the blood vessel, if you can push that blood out of, the, of, the, of, that, of that space with your finger, then the lividity is not completely fixed. And liver mortis starts within maybe 20 to 30 minutes of a person's death? Yes. Okay. And does it become fixed for probably three to six hours? Well, I mean, that's what you'll find maybe in a textbook, but again, it's one of those phenomena that is uh, highly, highly variable, and I've not found that it's very useful to use the um, averages and apply them to uh, individual bodies. Um, they're not hard and fast timelines. Again, it's the kind of thing that we use to, to, to determine whether or not we should accept the story. Now, I have had, I've done autopsies, uh, quite a few autopsies, because somebody who went to a scene says the person doesn't appear to have died when the claimant is, is stating it, based on the lividity and the, and the, and the, and the rigor mortis. And uh, sometimes uh, it's, sometimes they're right, it's not a good story. And then I think sometimes it is, it is a good story, and we're now just dealing with a person at the extreme. Uh, either of uh, early or late onset of rigor or fixed lividity. Um, turning to the brain injury, we saw the photograph of the reflected skull. In this particular case, um, would you agree that it was just a small amount of, of hemorrhage between the dura and the brain? Yes, I think I've uh, characterized it as 20 milliliters just on one side. Have you encountered cases where that was enough in and of itself to cause someone's death? Uh, I've seen blunt uh, head impact injuries with no hemorrhage that I believe were the cause of death. We talked about strangulation and asphyxiation. There's a difference between those two terms, correct? Uh, strangulation is a type of asphyxiation. Okay. And asphyxiation, I believe that you characterized it as, I wrote it down, a uh, deficit of oxygen to the brain. Yes. So there are different types of asphyxiation, correct? Other yes. Other than strangulation. What are some other types of asphyxiation? Well, you can have uh, suffocation. Right? You can put a person in an enclosed space. Uh, you can have a smothering. You can prevent the person from uh, breathing by placing something over their face, their mouth, and their nose. Uh, you can have what's called uh, positional asphyxiation, where you end up uh, in a position, say you're, you're hunched over or you're, you're compressed between 
uh, two different uh, objects, and you can no longer expand your chest uh, to breathe. Um, or an object. Drowning is a type of uh, asphyxiation. Or an object, choking. Choking, yes, choking now to us, to forensic pathologists means airway obstruction, not you know grabbing a person by the neck. Um, those are, I think, we've gotten most of the common types of asphyxiation. Fair enough. And when we talk about petechial hemorrhage as a sign of asphyxiation, you would see potentially petechiae or petechial hemorrhage in any of those types of asphyxiation, correct? Well, um, there are two schools of thought to that. It was, I think, at one time, the petechial hemorrhages were considered to be a function of the actual oxygen deficit. Uh, I don't believe that that's considered to be the case now. I think the petechiae are really the, uh, the, the, the result of uh, the pressure that builds up within, within the blood vessels. So we don't expect to see um, petechiae in cases of uh, suffocation or cases of drowning. Um, you know, the most common asphyxial death that we and most other medical examiners would, would see would be hanging. And uh, rarely do you see uh, petechial hemorrhages and hanging. I don't know if I use the word rare, but it's probably less than 5%. You mentioned positional asphyxiation. That would potentially cause, cause petechiae, correct? Yes, uh, it does. So uh, sometimes people, it gets confusing whether you're talking about positional asphyxiation versus, say, uh, traumatic uh, asphyxiation, whereas you're having like a heavy object laying on your uh, torso and you can't breathe, it's putting pressure on your torso. Things like that frequently occur in automobile accidents when there's entrapment. And in those cases, you, you do sometimes see uh, petechial hemorrhages. What about um, as far as po positional asphyxiation? I had a really hard time with the word asphyxiation on yesterday or Friday, whatever our last day was here. Um, so I apologize in advance. I, uh, can't get through that word. Um, but when you talk about positional asphyxiation, I think you talked about, you talked just now about uh, compression of the chest, where there's an object resting on the chest. Um, is it also consistent with the body being in a particular position or posture where the, the blood can't flow or where the air can't flow? Yes, it can be, and uh, these are circumstances that you, you often see in a person that's intoxicated with, you know, alcohol or some other substance, and they, you know, they might just fall between their, their bed and the wall, and uh, they, you know, are, are too intoxicated to save themselves, and uh, they get wedged tighter and tighter. Um, you can also see deaths like that in uh, babies, you know, who, who uh, are not strong enough to free themselves uh, from uh, in wedging or entrapment. Turning to your example of the intoxicated person, um, what if they fell and hit their head on the toilet and then maybe slumped over a bathtub? Um, could that create a positional asphyxiation if the edge of the bathtub were compressing their jugular or carotid artery or both? Oh, I, su I suppose um, it, um, it would be hard to get uh, it would be hard to get that kind of a pressure. Um, just based on the weight of your, it's mostly going to be your head. Um, I guess there would be some contribution of the weight of your torso. Um, I wouldn't completely rule it out. You talked about um, blunt force trauma quite a bit um, as being your opinion of how the a lot of the lacerations or abrasions were caused to the face. Um, through the questioning, the direct examination with the prosecutor, you talked about um, you know, punching someone with a fist. There are other types of blunt force trauma though, correct? Yes. Um, so blunt force trauma is opposed to sharp force trauma? Yes. So sharp force trauma would be a stabbing, something with a sharp object? Yes. Blunt force trauma would be Anything else <laughs> that's yeah. not sharp. Sure. Blunt, a blunt object. So it could be the floor? Could be the floor. Could be a wall? Yes. Could be a shelf? Yes. Could be a sink? Yes. Could be a toilet? Yes. Could be a weapon of some type that's not sharp, correct? Yes. Can you rule out any of those 
in terms of the injuries that you saw? Well, um, not for each individual injuries, but um, taking the the totality of the of the injuries, I don't I don't find a um, a compelling um, explanation uh, for those uh, for those injuries. In, Could a person strike their head on one location, hit something on the way down, and then hit the floor, creating multiple injuries, multiple blunt force trauma injuries? That's always a possibility, but I wouldn't expect to see the injuries on you know both sides of the head and on the on the front of the neck, um, and those structures uh, that are injured um, in the decedent, uh, they're they're fairly well uh, protected, and um, it's uh, not the type of injury um, that we would see. Um, in something that is uh, accidental in nature. You did talk about fractures to the hyoid bone. Um, there are other explanations for fractures. I mean, you see those in other types of injuries other than just strangulation, correct? Yes, um, you see them in uh, uh, certain gunshot wounds to the head. You can see a, fr a hyoid fracture, even though it's not uh, in the path of the, of the bullet. Uh, in automobile accidents, you can see when there's direct um, um, uh, trauma to the to the neck. Uh, what about sudden hyperextension of the neck, the neck being snapped back maybe because of a fall or, like you said, uh, acceleration. Yeah, so I don't know that I've ever seen that. I've read reports of things like that, but those are those are rare, I think, uh, examples, and you don't have the other findings uh, with it. What about falling against a rigid object? Yes, falling against a rigid object could potentially uh, cause something like that. Uh, but I, I don't think it's going to give you that type of petechial hemorrhage, and it's not going to give you the abrasions on the neck. and um, It's not going to give you the strap muscle hemorrhage. Um, so, uh, I mean, it's not like a, I didn't look for some other explanation, uh, but the totality of the, of the uh, injuries indicates to me inflicted trauma. Turning to the hands, um, I know that we went through all of the photographs. You talked about finding some fractures to the skull. Did you find any fractures to any of the fingers? No, I don't believe there were any fractures of the fingers. No lacerations to the fingers? No. You talked about some of the things that were collected um, from the body, uh, various swabs. Uh, I think it's also been discussed that fingernail clippings are taken at the time of the autopsy. Is that accurate? That's correct. Okay. Why, why is that? Why are fingernail clippings take, taken? Uh, uh, a person can have uh, trace evidence uh, collected uh, from their, their fingernails. It could either be their their own skin, or it could be the skin of, a, of a, another individual. We talked about, when, while we're talking about um, different things that are collected from the body, you mentioned that there was a special request to swab the hands and the neck. Um, was, were those things done? Yes. And in the timeline, um, I know that the, the hands were specifically bagged. Um, were those swabs taken before or after the body was cleaned? Before. Are you familiar with the term alacrima? Uh, the alacronon? Alacrima. A-L-A-C-R-I-M-A. -A -A, alacrima. No. May I have a moment now? When you were conducting your autopsy, um, you hadn't had an opportunity to speak with the accused in this case, correct? Correct. And you hadn't seen any interviews with regard to, uh, you hadn't seen any interviews involving him either, correct? I don't believe so. Sitting here today, 
you've opined the cause and manner of the death, but you have no opinion as to the who. Is that correct? That's correct. Right. Thank you.